am here with Ekoswehi Yahin, who is the Secretary General of the Insurance Development Forum. And we're partners, I'm a member of the Operating Committee of the IDF, and the IDF is, is dedicated to using insurance as a strategy to sustain and grow development goals and so much more. And so the COP27 is a big moment for the IDF. So first, tell us about the IDF, you know, in short, and then what are y'all doing here? Okay, great. Thanks, Kathy. It's really great to be part of this. Uh, and also congratulations on the incredible work that you are doing uh, with your institution. Um, so the Insurance Development Forum, as you had mentioned, is a public-private partnership led by the insurance industry, uh, but co-chaired with the United Nations as well as the World Bank Group and other international organizations. Uh, and our objective really is to use insurance and related risk management capabilities to help drive resilience. If we are talking about people, communities, businesses, um, and even governments. And so that's really thinking about what are the tools that exist in the industry in terms of risk modeling, right through to underwriting, uh, right through to also looking at the other side of insurance ba balance sheets in terms of as institutional investors, and how can we bring that to bear in terms of addressing the kinds of impacts that we are seeing with climate change. So it's really a, a, a great um, honor to be able to be part of the Adrian Arsht uh, Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center, and again, the work that you're doing around heat and just resilience in general. So one of the things that I think people often don't fully understand is how insurance could help someone at the lowest ends of the economic ladder in developing economies and in rural and urban settings. How does insurance help people um, suffering from the impacts of climate change? Yeah, I think that there are several ways in which we can think about this. Um, on a basic level, it is about financial protection, right? It's about the fact that you have people in developing countries, people who are in uh, lower income populations, who are trying to live their lives, right? But they can't take the risks <laughs> or, or, that they need to take in order to grow their businesses, no right? No. Exactly, if you have a drought um, event, what is the recourse for action in terms of financial uh, protection? Um, we also are faced with the reality that in most developing countries, we are talking about 2 to 3% in terms of insurance penetration in these countries. And even in developed markets, there are huge swaths of populations uh, that don't have access to insurance coverage. So what we are trying to do is to really think about how do we plug that protection gap? Uh, how do we also think about not just intervening after an event have, has occurred, but thinking beforehand to prepare, to put resources aside, to understand what are the risks that we are faced with. Do we have the adequate resources available to us um, and to try to build that resilience capacity? So that's really um, the focus of the IDF. And our presence here at COP is really to try to bring that into the adaptation discussion. The fact that we are seeing huge, when we think about the magnitude of losses that countries, communities, individuals are facing. So that prompts us to really reflect on what are the protection systems that these communities and our governments need. So when you think about how climate has compounding effects on people who, as you were saying, they don't have a rainy day fund, they don't have backup. But one of the ways that insurance also works is to help bring finance into things that don't only protect uh, and recovery, and not protect but recover, but um, reduce the risk, so build resilience into a system. And so what are some of the mechanisms or approaches? I think IDF has some pretty cool stuff happening. You've got something in Peru. Yeah, yeah what are some of your projects? Yeah, so I'll, you're, you're right. We have a project in Peru at the moment, uh, which is really focused on ensuring public schools. And it came out of the experience of El Nino in 2017, 2018 in the country, where there were huge floods, destruction in terms of public assets. And so the government felt like we need to provide some coverage for these schools in order to allow us to build the schools quickly after we have another event, but also to allow children to get back into school and to continue, right? Um, but as part of that program, what we are doing is actually building a database of what does that infrastructure stock look like for the government. That has applicability not only in terms of the insurance coverage, but also for the government to have a database that it can look at its infrastructure and say, what is the quality of that infrastructure? What do I need to invest in that to make that more resilient? And the impacts of that are profound because it's not only um, the insurance element, but it's in the long term when we see 
uh, issues around climate change, making sure that our infrastructure can actually withstand the kind of events that we expect. So you mentioned something really important, and that is the um, pre-event financing and pre-event insurance. So I think the number is something like 85%. Now, 90% of the disasters are predictable, and yet 80 or 85% of the funding is still coming after the event. So the, the hurricane, the cyclone, the heat wave, whatever it is. And so this pre-event financing idea is, is not only novel, it's got huge potential to save lives and even do some risk reduction. So maybe can you give me an example of yes. how that might work? Yeah, absolutely. And you're spot on in terms of what we are dealing with, right? Um, and I'll also maybe draw an, um, a comparison to the COVID-19 experience where there was a study done by the Center for Disaster Protection and it showed that only 2% to the point that you are making of financing to respond was actually prearranged. We can do better, right? And when we think about natural um, disasters from climate change, the figures are not that much better, right? So the issue of ex-ante financing is extremely critical. So one of the things that we've been doing in the IDF is not only looking at a project level through the examples I gave in Peru, but also at a global policy level. How do we shift the dialogue in terms of the importance of ex-ante financing? And at COP, we are actually seeing some remarkable developments. So earlier in the year, we had the G7, and the V20, which is a group of 55 of the most vulnerable uh, countries and ministers of finance, endorsed what we're referring to as the Global Climate Protection Shield. And that idea and that effort is really about this shift that we're talking about, right? How do we move some of that humanitarian financing that comes after the fact? It is too late, it is too small, right? Yeah. To before the fact, to allow people to proactively think about what are those risks. And it's not something that we naturally want to do, but we have to do it, right? Yeah, we do. How can we align the, um, the resources that we have and use it in a much more efficient way, right? So we are talking, yes, about more resources, but we are also talking about efficiency in the use of resources. And that's important for resilience. Amen, amen. Okay, so one more question. How did you get into this work? Oh, wow. Where did you, what, how'd you start? Um, I started, I have to admit, it was a bit of a, uh, my, my, a, fluke. a fluke, yes. And most people, I think, who engage in insurance will tell you it's a little bit of a fluke. Yeah. But once you get in, it's pretty cool. I'm right? hooked. I'm hooked. You're hooked, exactly. Um, so I got into it because when I went to do my master's uh, at London School of Economics, I needed a dissertation topic, frankly, to work on. And I wanted something that could blend economics, finance, and environment, issues around the environment. And there was this idea that was bubbling up in the Caribbean, who, you know, those countries being hit by hurricane after hurricane, um, not being large enough to register on the global uh, media stage, uh, perhaps some countries being too rich to access resources. And so the idea was, how can we mobilize funding for those countries in a predictable way? And I, got in, I wrote my dissertation, I interviewed the board. At the end of it, they said, do you want to join us? to translate an idea into reality. And I have loved it ever since then. Oh, that is fantastic. That is fantastic. Well, thank you for being such a wonderful partner and for taking a few minutes. We we'll, could talk and talk forever, but um, thank you, Echo Swahi, and we'll look forward to having another conversation. Thank you. Thank for you. Having me.